I'd like to uh, tell you in the, in the tradition of, of Grand Rounds to open up with uh, a few clinical vignettes. Uh, these are all uh, local. Uh, the first one is a 13-year-old girl from Connecticut who was attending a wedding uh, in Port Orchard. And she had a brief uh, minor viral syndrome, but subsequent to that, she developed respiratory distress and she needed to be transported to Children's Hospital. At uh, Children's Hospital, she required ECMO and ventilatory support in the ICU. She had blood cultures and sputum positive for MRSA, and her viral cultures were positive for influenza B. Unfortunately, she, did, she died despite aggressive uh, treatment, uh, including vancomycin, clindamycin, and intravenous immune globulin. The second patient is a 20-year-old college student at Western Washington University who was brought to the hospital by his roommate. He had also had a flu-like illness and subsequently uh, developed pneumonia and became increasingly obtunded until his roommate became concerned about him and brought him in. He grew uh, MRSA from his sputum uh, on uh, culture and he died uh, less than a week later despite getting uh, aggressive and appropriate antibiotic therapy. The third case is a previously healthy 49-year-old man who was airlifted to Harborview from Alaska and he was in respiratory distress. He began noting a cough and flu-like symptoms one week before uh, arriving at Harborview. And on arrival, uh, he was quite unstable. He was uh, hypotensive, tachypneic, he had a high fever, and he had blood-tinged respiratory secretions. He also had uh, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, some azotemia, hypoxemia, and acidosis on blood gas, and his sputum grew MRSA. He slowly recovered, but only after months of hospitalization. In infectious disease and in the microbiology laboratory, we've become fairly accustomed to seeing uh, people with compromised immunity, people who have received cytotoxic chemotherapy, people at the extremes of age, uh, be susceptible to infectious agents and develop fulminant uh, disease on occasion. But what's really remarkable about uh, uh, these cases of MRSA infection is that they happen in people who are otherwise completely healthy, who we might identify as being uh, some of the most healthy among us. This is the chest x-ray from our patient at Harborview, and you can see dense uh, consolidation bilaterally. And on CT scan, it's more uh, revealing because you can see multiple areas of cavitation with surrounding infiltrate, uh, which is characteristic of Staph aureus pneumonia, that it ignores uh, lobar boundaries, involves multiple uh, areas of the lung, and causes frequent cavitation. The uh, relationship between uh, influenza and Staph aureus is well known, and a couple of very recent papers have really brought attention to this. One uh, by Tony Fauci, uh, the, the uh, one in Journal of Infectious Disease, brings attention to the fact that many of the patients who came to autopsy after the 1918-19 Spanish flu epidemic had evidence of bacterial pneumonia, and it's believed that bacterial pneumonia was a major factor in the high mortality in that uh, pandemic. In the second uh, report, which is a, a much more recent report from just a few years ago, they were looking at children who died from influenza. And again, they found a large increase uh, of concomitant uh, bacterial infection, especially uh, colonization with Staph aureus. The relationship between uh, Staph aureus and, and influenza uh, is really something that I've been thinking about for a very long time, because when I was a medical student, my father almost died uh, from Staph pneumonia following influenza. He was home convalescing uh, from uh, his influenza illness, and then he seemed to take a turn for the worse, and my mother describes having to drag him to the car and just throw him in the back seat and drive him to the hospital. Uh, there, his internist was busy in clinic and said, just hang some penicillin, and I'll come by and see him uh, this evening. And, and my mother said um, to the nurse, uh, he can't do that. My husband is allergic to penicillin. So they changed the prescription to erythromycin, and that ended up saving his life because he had an erythrosusceptible Staph aureus. I'm not going to get into uh, detail about the mechanisms by which influenza predisposes to subsequent colonization and invasive infection with Staph aureus, but there are many mechanisms that have been described. There's a denudation of the epithelium, which promotes staphylococcal colonization, and there are various uh, interactions with the immune system, which impair uh, host defenses against Staph aureus. And so it's probably multifactorial why Staph so often follows influenza and why it can be so lethal in that setting. This is a recent uh, study uh, performed by CDC and uh, presented in Emerging Infectious Disease, and they were looking at the um, uh, 
how severe staphylococcal pneumonia could be when it came in the wake of influenza. A lot of these cases were MRSA, but MSSA can also be lethal in this setting. And uh, what you can see is that it had an unusually high mortality, almost uh, 30%. And then this uh, more recent work, which was just presented in poster form uh, at a meeting earlier this year, looked at Staph aureus community-acquired pneumonia in children during a very recent flu season. And what they found when they did this investigation in, based in a community, and I believe it was in Georgia, is that um, community-acquired Staph, Staph aureus pneumonia was more common than they had predicted from published work. They found 48 cases uh, during one flu season, and almost half of them were caused by MRSA. Uh, many of the patients who required hospitalization, the majority of them, didn't receive appropriate antibiotics. And they also found that cystic fibrosis uh, was a significant risk factor for developing this complication. Over half the patients ended up having to be admitted to the ICU, uh, and half of those got intubated, and there was a 13% mortality. And so now you need only to wander into the supermarket to see MRSA everywhere in the tabloids, and uh, most recently with our own uh, Seattle Times series of of articles bringing public attention uh, to this very serious infectious problem. But my favorite headline still remains the Daily Mirror with the mop of death, especially the caption um, that said one mop that we tested had 300 times the safe level of superbug MRSA. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't define what that level is. I, I can't escape this. I was on vacation in New Zealand with my family and we were walking down the street and here's this billboard where it's telling you to wash your hands. And, and uh, one of the characters uh, is, is saying, um, we're a very sharing company. And, and the other uh, is saying, you're serious? I can have staphylococcus? <laughs> so uh, with Christmas coming, you'll be pleased to know you can even get stuffed uh, MRSA toys <laughs> now in the mail. And what you know, little boy wouldn't be delighted to come bounding downstairs and find this in his stocking. Um, fortunately, there's also stuffed microbiologists that you can get to make the diagnosis. <laughs> so um, these data were kindly gathered uh, by Sue Gavin, hi Sue, uh, at the Harborview Lab, uh, looking at uh, the organisms at Harborview that we've uh, taken to be clinically serious and, and subject to susceptibility testing. And uh, in the year 2006, where uh, is the last year that we had a complete data set, it was remarkable to note that 40% of bacterial isolates that we were uh, performing susceptibility testing on are now Staph aureus. This is our dominant uh, problem. And more than half of those uh, were MRSA. If you look at the uh, curves following along the years, uh, MRSA was not always a problem at Harborview. There were little outbreaks. Uh, but if you see over the past several years, the MSSA problem has really remained constant unlike some situations that have been in the literature where MRSA has actually outcompeted MSSA or susceptible Staph aureus. At Harborview, we still have our uh, MSSA problem, but on top of that, we have this new massive MRSA problem that now uh, is even larger than our uh, baseline methicillin uh, susceptible organisms. And if you look at when I came to the uh, University of Washington in Harborview, um, <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing and I can't explain it. A lot of attention uh, became focused on, on the seriousness of MRSA as a, as a problem because of the study done by the CDC, where they showed that the, the estimated numbers of deaths in the U.S. from MRSA infection now exceeded uh, those deaths from HIV infection. And this was a shocking statistic to a lot of people in the public to really bring attention uh, to this organism. If you look at the population dynamics where you do careful typing of strains, as Sensabaugh and his colleagues did at at UC Berkeley, you see that uh, behind these crude numbers of how much MRSA you have and how much MSSA you have, there's really a great dynamic going on. And here, uh, in the year 2000, in the Bay Area, the predominant uh, MRSA strain was not the ones that we're hearing so much about now as community-acquired MRSA or USA 300. But over the subsequent couple of years, USA 300 took off and became far and away the dominant community-acquired MRSA strain in California. So they actually had another community-acquired MRSA strain previously, which virtually disappeared. And all along the West Coast, we have this strain called USA 300, which is genetically uh, virtually uh, clonal. And then in Alaska, there's some USA 400, and we have a little bit of that as well. So pr predominantly what we're seeing is an outbreak of an infectious disease caused by a very small number of strains which seem to have enhanced virulence. <laughs> 
an extremely important study and one that I think actually contradicts some of the um, uh, information posited in the recent articles in the newspaper uh, was done by uh, Catherine Liu and Chip Chambers group, a uh, really excellent staph aureus uh, research group out of San Francisco General Hospital. And what they did is really incredible to think about. They took one uh, year from 2004 to 2005 and they took every staph aureus that was isolated in, in laboratories in the city, nine hospitals in all, and they uh, performed strain typing on a large percentage of those isolates. They looked at susceptibility and they looked at the, the uh, clinical aspects. What you can see here is that this, in community onset disease, this was over 2,000 patients. The hospital onset disease was 225 patients. Granted, some of the patients who, who got their illness in the community might have been in the hospital setting and acquired their MRSA and then gone out and only then become uh, overtly infected. But if you look at the, uh, in the black, this represents USA 300, and this is an outpatient strain. What it looks like is actually outpatient community-acquired MRSA is now pouring into the hospital and being transmitted amongst hospitalized patients. When they looked at the time of onset of the uh, MRSA infection in the hospital setting, uh, the USA 300 infections were predominantly very early in the hospitalization and, and rarely afterwards. And that argues that really the patients came in colonized rather than they had uh, lateral transmission of disease once they were in the hospital. So to focus on this 10% on the right of hospital onset disease is really going to have uh, limited or no impact on the disease in the community. And I think this is something that we need also to come to grips with. Uh, Despite the fact that I presented uh, some cases at the beginning of this session in people who had no ostensible risk factors who developed uh, a serious and even fatal MRSA disease, there are groups of people that have been identified to be at increased risk for community-acquired MRSA. This includes football players, and there was an outbreak amongst the St. Louis Rams. Uh, uh, men who have sex with men uh, in California in particular, this has been identified. IV drug users and uh, people in jails. In the LA County Jail, they performed a surveillance study where they found over 70% of the inmates were carrying MRSA in their nares. The, the football outbreak was written up in the New England Journal a few years ago, and it was kind of interesting that they made this diagram showing you the players that got infected. <laughs> because when they, when they looked at colonization, many more people were colonized, but the ones that got frank infections were the, the, uh, the working class uh, linemen and linebacker type players, not the so-called skill positions, the ones who get the rug burns. And it argued that colonization was widespread, but disease would be most likely to occur when there was a trauma and staff would sense an opportunity. MRSA was first reported in 1961, and for uh, the next two decades or so, it was reported that all the MRSA in the world were clonally related, and that the uh, genetic element encoding methicillin resistance was extremely stable and that if you found MRSA in Australia or you found MRSA in Europe, you were dealing with strains that had a common lineage back. Now uh, the situation is much more chaotic. And if you look at, at the background, the genomic background in which methicillin resistance appears, it appears to be many different lineages. And we now have these community strains, not just USA 300, but others that are genetically quite dissimilar from each other. So what happened? It appears that uh, multiple events uh, involving these mobile genetic elements that carry the methicillin resistance occurred and what seemed to be a rather stable element, the MEC element, SEC MEC type 2, for example, now appeared to be able to jump from strain to strain. It's still not completely understood how this happened, uh, but Hiramatsu uh, in Japan has done some intriguing work characterizing the MEC cassette. And what you can see uh, at the top is the archetypal type 1 a methicillin resistance cassette which has regulatory genes and it's a kind of a conjugative transposon like element and it contains the gene encoding the alternative penicillin binding protein that makes these organisms resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics and that through mutation new MEC elements evolved that still had the essential uh, characteristics of a MEC element but they got smaller and smaller and these type 4 SEC MECs are now small enough that they can be much more efficiently uh, transmitted and so this allowed the evolution of a new kind of, of uh, methicillin resistant staph that we hadn't seen before. Uh, Chip Chambers is fond of saying that, that community acquired MRSA really reflects two things. One is that you have drug resistance and it makes it difficult to manage uh, these cases. And the other is, is that you have uh, virulence. And a lot of observations suggest that these strains are among the most virulent staph aureus and that they may have acquired additional 
virulence determinants on top of what was already a pretty virulent backbone. Two of the characteristics of staph that seem slightly uh, contradictory, uh, but one is that uh, the biggest defense against staph aureus is the neutrophil. And if you have a staph infection uh, in a normal host, what you're going to see is pus. And so you can say if you don't have the ability to make neutrophils, you're going to be more susceptible to staph. But what you see in that pus is loads of gram-positive cocci happily replicating. So what you also have to say is pus is important, but it's not enough. And so staph can evade phagocytosis, but some of the staph do get into neutrophils. And then these mechanisms by which staph uh, subverts the function of the neutrophil and prevents it from killing uh, the staph are very important. As, as my colleague Bob Dom at University of Chicago said, staph keeps finding ways to outsmart us. So in that opening uh, title slide, you saw a neutrophil that was chock full of staph aureus. And in the clinical lab, what we'll see is sheets of neutrophils and occasional extracellular bacteria. And then you'll see an unlucky neutrophil that is just full of organisms. And I used to think maybe those were the neutrophils that were really hungry or really good at phagocytosing. Now I realize that what happens is there's this battle between neutrophil and pathogen. And sometimes the pathogen wins. And when that happens, the neutrophil undergoes apoptosis prematurely, and then the pathogen replicates in a safe site within the neutrophil till the cell lysis. And so you really have this uh, ongoing cycle of intracellular, extracellular, intracellular bacteria where the neutrophil that's supposed to kill the organism becomes an incubator for the organism. And uh, Frank DeLeo has revisited some old studies from David Rogers in the 50s where he's shown that this can be mimicked uh, in vitro in the laboratory setting with his own white cells where he can infect these white cells and see this cycle. So something that's been talked about a lot and filtered down to laboratory medicine is this particular putative virulence factor called PVL or the panton valentine leukocidin. Uh, to read the medical literature, you would think that this was something uh, discovered very recently, but it was actually discovered in the 30s, and it was found in a very small percentage of Staph aureus strains. But what uh, this group, uh, Jerome Etienne and colleagues in France, uh, uh, in Lyon, described is that strains carrying the Panton Valentine leukocidin, which is a particularly common determinant in these community-acquired MRSA strains, seem to be associated with much more severe disease. And they postulated that the ability of, of Staph aureus to cause this really fulminant disease, especially the pneumonia, like the cases I showed you at the beginning, might relate to Panton Valentine leukocidin. The clinicians, desperate to have something to grab onto that they could use to optimize therapy, seized on this and they wanted laboratories to see if PVL was present and that they would change antibiotics if PVL was present. And, th and this uh, was an example of the clinical practice really getting a little bit ahead of the basic science. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about PVL and then uh, where we are in thinking about it right now. In 2002 in The Lancet, Etienne's group wrote, pneumonia caused by PVL positive Staph aureus seems to be a specific disease entity with a poor prognosis. It occurs in otherwise healthy children and young adults and is preceded by a flu-like syndrome characterized by fever, hemoptysis, and leukopenia, progresses rapidly to uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And they showed this very persuasive uh, Kaplan-Meier plot where you can see that if you had an infection with a PVL positive strain that your mortality was significantly higher and, and more likely to develop rapidly. This uh, slide provided by David Spock shows how PVL has been shown to work. It's, the, it's a binary toxin. It has two components from the LUC-S and LUC-F genes and when you put them together and add them to a white cell it makes the white cell blow up. Only 5% of, of, of Staph aureus strains overall carry Panton valentine leukocidin. So this seemed like a very plausible hypothesis, and a paper uh, in the prestigious journal Science uh, showed that if you either took purified PVL and added it uh, to the lungs of, of uh, laboratory animals, or if you took a baseline Staph aureus strain that didn't have PVL that was MSSA, and you put in a phage that overexpressed the toxin, then you could get uh, here with the phage and here just with the toxin by itself, this severe inflammatory and necrotizing uh, uh, pneumonia with, with uh, hemorrhage, and it looked very much like uh, some of the uh, biopsies from patients with MRSA pneumonia. And so this looked very promising, but there were some uh, clues that this might not be uh, as simple as it seemed. One of them was a study by uh, Yovanka Vojic when she was at the Rocky Mountain Labs with Frank DeLeo. And what she showed is that, yes, Staph aureus does lyse neutrophils, but if you take a mutant of this MW2 uh, type, one of the uh, 
uh, highly virulent community-acquired strains, and you make a knockout and you compare the isogenic strains that only differ at the PVL locus, you find there's no difference in the black and the red, which shows you the ability uh, of the Staph aureus to lyse neutrophils. So Staph without this toxin can still lyse neutrophils. Subsequently, um, Olaf Schneven at the University of Chicago with a pediatrics ID fellow, uh, Julianne Bubek wardenberg uh, performed a really nice study showing that the, the alpha hemolysin uh, of, of Staph aureus, which is, is held by all Staph aureus, not just MRSA, was absolutely required for the ability to cause pneumonia in mice. And they've even gone on to show that raising an immune response to that hemolysin can provide some protection against the severity of pneumonia. But PVL had no effect. So now you have the, the highly virulent strain and you take away its PVL and the pneumonia in the experimental system looks the same. And the, the most common presentation of community-acquired MRSA infections is actually skin and soft tissue infections. And here they looked at a mouse model of skin and soft tissue infection, and they actually found that the mutant without PVL caused bigger lesions and more severe skin disease. So um, Dennis Stevens, a University of Washington affiliate faculty member who's at the Boise, Idaho VA, performed a study where he took uh, Staph aureus strains from different patients with different kinds of clinical disease and different severity of disease. And he tried to see uh, if there was any correlation between how much pantin valentine leukocidin they had. Um, and what he ended up finding is the production, the amount of pantin valentine leukocidin amongst these strains did not correlate with the severity of infection. So my conclusion from all of this work is that PVL is a marker for the highly virulent strain. It's not the cause of virulence in these strains. And targeting PVL, either for diagnosis or for treatment, is likely not to be very effective because it's not really the cause of, of the serious illness. And as Forrest Gump would say, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> now, there are many other virulence factors, and, and uh, Francois Perdrill Remington uh, at UCSF has performed a study uh, where um, she took a number of MRSA strains from the hospital and MR MRSA strains from the community and uh, performed uh, array studies to see if specific virulence genes were present, different kinds of toxins, super antigens, and so on. And as you can see, both the hospital and the community-acquired strains have many candidate virulence factors. An interesting group of virulence factors that Michael Otto uh, has, has proposed are these so-called PSMs or phenol-soluble modulins. There are these uh, small peptides, which all staff make, but the community-acquired strains seem to make much more. And this is up here, this would be your neutrophil, and this is your neutrophil on phenol-soluble modulins. And you can see that these have a very potent activity in lysing white blood cells. And when they delete the locus, um, you can see here a, a cutaneous lesion with a um, USA 400 strain, and here the lesion is much uh, less severe. Uh, in, a, in a mouse uh, infected with the strain lacking the phenol-soluble modulins. So the, instead of having the presence or absence of a virulence factor, what might differ in these more virulent strains is that they overexpress a conserved virulence factor found in other Staph aureus strains. Another interesting element is one that uh, is next to the MEK element uh, called ACME. And this is a, an element that contains uh, the gene for an enzyme that can uh, catabolize arginine, the amino acid. This is very interesting to me because arginine is the precursor for nitric oxide made by the body's nitric oxide synthase. And this is a very important antimicrobial mediator made by um, not only neutrophils but by macrophages and other host cells. And carried along with the resistance determinant is the ACME determinant that may then antagonize the ability of the host to make nitric oxide. And these are some data from DEEP at UCSF showing that there is a competitive disadvantage to losing the ACME element and uh, we and, and he and Chip Chambers group are now collaborating to try to look in some of our models uh, to uh, try to see uh, what the interaction is between this element and, and host defense. So I don't have any data on that right now, but I will show you some data from our lab about another aspect of nitric oxide and Staph aureus uh, that was published a few months ago. Uh, in this case, we found a mechanism by which Staph aureus could resist the antimicrobial effects of nitric oxide made by the host. One of the interesting uh, factoids from this talk you might carry away with is that your nose is full of the gas nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is made uh, both chemically and enzymatically at a variety of sites in the body and two of the places if you want to find the most NO is in the headspace gas of your stomach because of chemical uh, uh, 
action of, of acidification of dietary uh, nitrite. And then in your nose, where it's enzymatic, made by nitric oxide synthase, in the cells lining uh, uh, in the epithelium, lining uh, the paranasal sinuses. And uh, what people have found is that these nitric oxide concentrations fall in patients with sinusitis. And uh, John Lundberg at, at the Karolinska has shown that if you hum vigorously um, several times an hour, you can actually uh, change the dynamics of your nasal passages and increase your nitric oxide concentrations in your nose and ameliorate the effects of sinus disease, although your friends will probably kill you. <laughs> so these are subjects who had low levels of nitric oxide and then they uh, spent some time humming and got other therapy <laughs> and nitric oxide rose. And the interesting thing for me is that nitric oxide is a very broad spectrum antimicrobial agent. And yet, where do we find Staph aureus most commonly? We find it in the nose. And so uh, Tony Richardson, a postdoc, a very talented scientist who recently uh, finished his fellowship and went on to become a faculty member at uh, North Carolina, he performed some studies where he showed that in Staph aureus, if you add nitric oxide, and here in blue is this little spike of nitric oxide from an NO donor, if you look in red, you can see oxygen consumption. There's just a tiny little hitch in oxygen consumption while the NO concentration is high. And then the staph metabolizes it and the, the uh, respiration uh, continues and, and oxygen is completely consumed. He then took a mutant lacking an enzyme, HMP, which metabolizes NO to the non-toxic molecule nitrate. And he showed that now when he added the nitric oxide, it hung around a lot longer and you can see that it inhibited uh, Staph aureus respiration. It will do this to your own respiration in your own cells. Nitric oxide is a very broad spectrum inhibitor of respiration. And yet, when he took uh, different bacteria, including Staph, and he put them in a culture where he treated them with NO, all of the bacteria remained completely inhibited for the duration of the study, as long as nitric oxide was around. The exception, and the only exception that we've really found so far, is that a variety of Staph aureus strains, both MRSA, hospital and community strains, and methicillin-susceptible Staph aureus would grow in the presence of nitric oxide. This seemed remarkable and, and uh, raised the, the possibility that this resistance to NO might help to explain why Staph can grow in an environment like the nose, which is hostile uh, to other microbial life. Bacillus appears to be killed, but this was actually sporulation. When he uh, looked at doubling time as a more uh, um, uh, useful measurement of growth, you can see that where the nitric oxide is added, that everybody is stopped in their tracks. But what distinguishes Staph aureus is it thinks about it for a few minutes and then it starts growing again at a different rate, about half the rate that it was dividing at before. And this suggested to Tony that maybe Staph aureus under the pressure of nitric oxide was entering into a distinct metabolic state. And he entered into some studies to analyze this. One of the things he did was he performed transcriptional microarray studies and looked at the genes in Staph aureus that were turned on uh, by nitrosative stress. This was performed in collaboration with Paul Dunman at the University of Nebraska. And you can see that iron acquisition genes were turned on and also genes that are known to be involved in hy uh, hypoxic fermentative metabolism. And Tony decided to pursue this lead to see if a different kind of metabolism was allowing staph to escape. And this very complicated slide is basically showing, stacked on top of each other, the different acids which are produced from fermentation by Staph aureus. And here we have wild type, and then we have a progression of strains that are mutated to be missing the enzyme for L-lactate dehydrogenase. And in each column, you can see the effects of whether oxygen is present and whether nitric oxide is added. And, and to summarize the data for you, I can tell you that under aerobic conditions, you see primarily acetate. Under anaerobic conditions, you see staph pour out a mixture of, of different acids. But when nitric oxide is added to the mix, whether it's aerobically or anaerobically, you start to see this monotonous pattern of L-lactate predominantly and a little bit of D-lactate fermentation. And interestingly, one of the lactate dehydrogenases, one that is uniquely induced by nitrosative stress, is co-regulated with the flavohemoglobin that detoxifies the NO. This suggested to us that this might actually be a cassette for both uh, detoxifying and bypassing the actions of nitric oxide. Now why would you need lactate dehydrogenase to bypass the actions of nitric oxide? Tony showed that these two enzymes, pyruvate dehydrogenase and pyruvate formate lyase, which normally would be producing uh, the, the uh, um, acetate and the ethanol and the formate that we had expected to see, which you would see anaerobically, were being inhibited completely 
by nitric oxide, whereas the lactate dehydrogenases and the alcohol dehydrogenase were resistant to the actions of NO. Why is it so important to be able to make L-lactate? Well, it's not the lactate you need. The cell just disposes of that and pours it out. But you need some place to accept electrons so that you can maintain your NAD. The NAD, uh, NADH ratio is vitally important uh, as redox balance for the metabolism of the cell. And when the NAD levels would collapse in these lactate dehydrogenase deficient mutants, the cells could no longer grow in the presence of nitric oxide. This indicates that Staph aureus happens to have this kind of metabolism where it has an NO responsive lactate dehydrogenase that allows it to maintain redox balance when nitric oxide is around. This probably evolved for reasons uh, preceding uh, the, the intimate association of Staph aureus with human hosts and by biological accident ended up pre-adapting it to survive in niches that are hostile uh, for other bacteria. And so to test this further, uh, Tony took these mutants that couldn't make L-lactate and he tested them for virulence in a mouse model where you inject bacteria into the veins and then they uh, localize in the kidney and you get these huge abscesses. This is a kidney from the mouse just at low magnification. You can see these huge abscesses. And in the absence of lactate dehydrogenase, the abscesses went away and the bacteria became virtually avirulent. But if you took away host nitric oxide, which was really the reason that the bacteria had to make uh, lactate dehydrogenase and, and uh, L-lactate, then you could restore virulence and uh, tissue damage. So um, in the minutes remaining, I'd like to talk about some practical aspects of, of MRSA. With all the attention being focused on MRSA, um, this hasn't escaped the notice of our politicians. And Governor Gregoire, um, last year in a highly touted um, move, assembled a panel um, that's what you do, uh, I learned during the last campaign, when you have some serious problem, you, you get a blue ribbon panel together and you discuss it. And so a panel was convened to decide what to do about MRSA and um, new regulations were put forth for laboratories. But it was kind of interesting because uh, they, they said laboratories are strongly encouraged to report MRSA, but it didn't say that they had to. And it also didn't say what was going to be done with the data. And so far as I can tell, um, nothing. And laboratories are really uh, paranoid about reporting these things. And when you're asked to report things, they always say, you know, who wants to know and why? Because are these things going to be tied to some sort of uh, punitive issue? And a lot of things which really have no business in patient care end up entering into the discussion. And so. Um, since that time, there's been a tremendous amount of discussion about what should we be doing about our MRSA problem. Should we, we be reporting it? Should we be looking for it in everyone? And I would like to review briefly some of the methods that are used in the laboratory to detect it. There's the age-old method of culture, but of course, Staph aureus looks like Staph aureus. And so to tell if it's MRSA, you need some so other sort of method to, to uh, uh, detect the PBP2A product. And the easiest way to do that is probably to use this latex test for PBP2A. And so you can take a colony and see if it's MRSA. But it requires overnight incubation to allow the bacteria time to grow. The process can be sped up a little bit by using these um, chromogenic media. And there are a variety of commercial ones available. And MRSA can be identified because it produces a different color. It's, it's a turquoise in this particular medium. Uh, and it stands out from the other organisms. So again, this is a culture method, and it takes a while. Uh, so people. Uh, are impatient about MRSA because if you're admitting somebody to a hospital and you're going to make a decision about what bed to put them in, you don't want to have them sitting around for 24 hours for the bacteria to grow. And so molecular methods have shown promise in this area. And this is one uh, commercial uh, platform, the gene expert platform, uh, uh, for molecular detection. The, the disadvantage of this is it's very expensive, but the advantage of it is it's very rapid. Um, another disadvantage is the molecular target is not really the uh, gene that is responsible for the methicillin-resistant phenotype. Uh, the methicillin resistance gene can also be found in other staphylococci that are not staph aureus, that are not particularly virulent. So if you just looked for the MECA gene in the NARIs of patients at, on a molecular level, you would find all of this coagulase negative staphylococci and you would be mistakenly calling them MRSA. Uh, so what the company has done instead is to amplify um, a, a fragment from the junction of where the MEC, uh, SEC MEC cassette uh, integrates into the Staph, Staph aureus chromosome. And that turns out to be unique to Staph aureus. Uh, 
the trouble is, is that evolution happens. You know, we're approaching the 200th uh, birthday of Darwin and the 150th birthday of the origin of species, and, and so it's appropriate to talk about that. And some methicillin-resistant strains have picked up MACA and lost it, but they retain this ancestral fragment at the junction. And so these are MSSA strains, but your molecular testing will tell you they're MRSA. If this was a one in a thousand you know, event, we wouldn't worry about it. But in some series, it's been as high as 15 or 20 percent. So these are patients coming to the hospital, and then they're, they're subjected to molecular testing and being told they have MRSA, and then being stuck in a ward with other MRSA patients. And then the next day, we do culture backup, and we find out, oh, it wasn't really MRSA. It was just an empty uh, junction. Sorry. Um, so this, this has also created some complications. And then what sites are you going to screen? Uh, most uh, studies have looked at, at nasal cultures, and you can see that the nose is a very common site uh, to carry Staph aureus. It's estimated, though, that a third of the world is, is walking around with Staph aureus on them, and only about 2 or 3 percent of these are MRSA, although that's going to depend on the population you look at. So if you have MRSA carriage, what are the odds that you're going to get into trouble with it? It turns out that if you have MSSA, the odds are about 1 in 10. If you have MRSA, they're considerably higher. But still, 3 out of 4 people with MRSA carriage will not have invasive disease, according to the study in the American Journal. And some of the community-acquired strains uh, seem to be more promiscuous in the sites that they colonize. So you're more likely to find them in the armpits or maybe in the groin and not necessarily in the nose. And if you're talking about 40 or $50 a pop for a molecular test to detect MRSA, and now you want to look at three or four different sites on people that are, are coming in, you can see that this can start to run into real money. The big question then is if you do embark on a screening uh, protocol, and this says the patient in the next bed is highly infectious. Thank God for these curtains. Um, what are you going to do with the information? You know, at a lot of places, what you're going to try to do is, is to cohort those patients and, and to segregate the ones that have MRSA from the ones that don't. But some of those patients are really not very infectious. They may be only colonized in the nose uh, compared to someone who has an active infection or is colonized on the skin. And then uh, you have to have the beds to be able to surge these patients uh, to. And uh, this is a, a big issue at Harborview. And then can you do anything to decolonize the patient? There is, there is a regimen, uh, this is a paper from Toronto uh, studying this regimen, which is reasonably effective. But, you know, if we get colonized with the meningococcus in the setting of an outbreak, we take one pill and the meningococcus is reliably eradicated. We don't have that for MRSA. So if you have MRSA and your physician decides that you want to try to eradicate colonization, you have to be scrubbed down from head to toe uh, with a disinfectant, chlorhexidine gluconate, then you have to squirt this kind of uh, slightly nasty uh, pseudomonic acid, mupyrosin, into your nares twice a day for at least five days uh, to a week. And then you have to take a combination of antibiotics, which very frequently give GI side effects and interact with other drugs, doxycycline and rifampin. And you have to take it for a week. And this is fairly effective, but it's not as effective as, say, meningococcal prophylaxis. And then the relapse rate is pretty considerable. So if you follow these patients at six to eight months after you decolonize them, many of them have become colonized again. So we don't have a really simple, inexpensive, reliably effective method of decolonization. So a, a major debate is going on. And, and this is a debate that not only involves physicians, but it involves uh, the community, and it involves politicians, and it involves the media. And, and this has, I think, uh, polarize people a little bit about what should be done about MRSA. And at the, at the most recent idsa ICIC, uh meeting, uh, it was a hot topic of discussion, but there was a lot of disagreement. There were even point-counterpoint debate sessions about universal screening uh, for MRSA. People would cite this study from Evanston where the three Northwestern University hospitals underwent an intervention, which was to do universal molecular screening. And they seemed to see a substantial reduction in their MRSA cases. It, it also resulted in identification of many patients who wouldn't have been identified by routine measures. So it increased the isolation days substantially, and it was much more effective than ICU-only screening, which is currently what's being done at Harborview. So this looks pretty compelling. And this combined with data from Pittsburgh and data from the VA system would be pretty suggestive that maybe this is an intervention that should be considered. On the other hand, in, in, uh, in JAMA just earlier this year, Stefan Harbarth and colleagues in, in Geneva performed a very nice crossover study where here in, in the dark columns you can see the MRSA cases 
at a hospital with fairly low MRSA prevalence. And you can see that the intervention, the universal screening, seemed to have no effect whatsoever in these different units in the incidence of MRSA. So will one size of, of MRSA control fit all medical centers? Probably not. And this is a subtlety which people are concerned might be lost if we have legislators deciding uh, what to do about MRSA control. Nevertheless, I think this dialogue is very important. This is a, an extremely serious public health problem, and certainly we want to have uh, input from as many sectors as possible in deciding how to approach this problem. What if you have a, a MRSA infection? The vast majority of them uh, are skin infections. In San Francisco, they really recognize these clinically when someone walks in the door and they don't even need a culture. And this is a typical uh, MRSA, uh, community acquired MRSA soft tissue infection where you see this large indurated uh, boil, it's very painful, and it will point and then it will be draining pus. At UCSF, they performed a really wonderful study. My former medical school classmate, Hobart Harris, who's a surgeon there, and Chip Chambers teamed up in surgical clinic where they incised and drained all of these abscesses. And they actually treated some with placebo as their antibiotic. They treated some uh, with, with trimethoprim sulfa in, in other series, which is an active antibiotic. They treated some with Keflex, which surgeons uh, love. And I used to uh, say when I was practicing ID regularly that, that cephalexin was useful to see in the chart because it was a sign of a poorly educated physician. But um, that was too harsh because what, what I think motivates a lot of physicians to use Keflex for staff is that these infections get better anyway. And Keflex has a very uh, safe profile. It's very well tolerated. I never had a patient complain about Keflex. And, it, and look, the rate of response to Keflex and placebo was really good. It was really just as good as the antibiotics that worked. And this indicates that proper surgical management of these soft tissue infections is paramount and that antibiotics play a minor, if any, role. Although Bradshaw at, at Arkansas has recently published a series where there was a tiny benefit to using uh, an antibiotic that had activity, and so uh, it's still the standard of care. The list of antibiotics to treat MRSA that are currently available are fairly limited. In black are the parenteral ones, and in blue are ones that could be used as step down or used uh, orally. And there just aren't a lot of choices, and they have a lot of issues with them. This is from a study from Vance Fowler in the New England Journal looking at uh, Staph aureus bacteremia, and they were comparing uh, the efficacy of this relatively new drug, daptomycin, versus standard therapy, which was generally vancomycin and aminoglycoside. And what you can see is that a successful outcome was found in 53 of 120 patients who got daptomycin, 48 of 115 who got the standard therapy. These are terrible numbers for infectious disease. This is, these are not success rates that we would brag about that we're used to seeing. And so the MRSA infections are hard to treat. And even when you treat with the correct antibiotic, a failure or prolonged course is common. So people have started to look at the laboratory and say, is there anything you can tell us about uh, why vancomycin is not working? And what people are seeing is there's a very slight difference in the minimal inhibitory concentration of vancomycin for different strains. And it's been argued that the ones that are at the resistant end of susceptible may still fail therapy more often than the ones that are fully susceptible. This is problematic, though, for a number of reasons, not least of which is it's hard to, to measure the MIC to this level of accuracy reproducibly. And secondly, most of the strains do not fall into this resistant range, and it still leaves you with a problem about how to manage the majority of your strains. Thirdly, if you look at the different methods used to measure the MIC to vancomycin, you see in the different colors without even looking at which uh, test is involved that the uh, proportion of strains in these different categories depends on the method that you use. And the reference method is actually not the one that everybody's using. So it, it's a very confusing area, but it's one in which uh, clinicians uh, are increasingly uh, clamoring for. If you have a serious infection, there's also uh, the theoretical benefit of adding a, a protein synthesis inhibitor like clindamycin or linazolid to stop the production of toxins. I hope I've kind of debunked PVL as the major virulence factor for you uh, based uh, on Frank DeLeo's and Olaf Schneewin's work. But uh, there's still a lot of other toxins that are produced like the alpha hemolysin. And so it makes sense in a life-threatening case to add a protein synthesis inhibitor by extrapolation from data with group A strep and uh, with clostridium perfringens. And then there's a new uh, set of cephalosporins. This is one of them, uh, ceftabiprol. Ceftaroline is also on the horizon, which are, are hoped might be approved by the FDA as early as next year, is already approved in Canada. 
And this is a cephalosporin that was selected to be able to bind to the penicillin binding protein 2A that MECA encodes. So it's a MRSA optimized cephalosporin that also has a spectrum similar to cefepime. And what you can see here in these data from Peter Applebaum are that ceftabiprol kills staph more rapidly than vancomycin does, which might translate into greater efficacy and make it more like treating an MSSA infection. What about vaccines? Everyone was hoping for a vaccine, and there are these capsule types that are predominant in Staph aureus, and the company Nabi uh, put a lot of investment into the development of a Staph vaccine. And a few years ago, uh, their big trial in dialysis patients with catheter infections failed utterly. And this has really chilled the field for Staph aureus vaccine development. Uh, I still think it's possible to make a Staph aureus vaccine, but the kind of infection they were trying to present, prevent, a line infection with a, a break in the integument and a foreign body present, is going to be really difficult to prevent with a vaccine that, that targets capsule. Uh, and, and so we need to understand more about the basic immunology of what's protective against Staph aureus and how to augment that. And in the meantime, this has really cooled enthusiasm. So if you got a little bit of a chill, uh, hearing about these cases at the beginning of these patients who seem very much like yourself or your children, young, healthy, healthy, vibrant, without risk factors, being struck down in the prime of life by this bacterial pathogen, it should give you a chill. And I think that one of the most important things that we can do for ourselves and our patients is to encourage flu shots. It may not prevent you from getting the flu, but it may ameliorate the disease sufficiently to make it less likely that you'll get this complication. And that's where our worst uh, case reports have come from. So in summary, we have some new MRSA strains around. They're really brand new. They're something that wasn't seen uh, before that have emerged due to evolution, due to the acquisition of this smaller, leaner, meaner uh, MET cassette in combination with certain virulence factors, which we're only now characterizing. And this is arising in both the community and the hospital setting. And so targeting only the hospital setting is unlikely, I think, to, to solve this problem. What are we going to do about control? Well, still, we have to pay careful attention to hygiene. We want to screen in the institutional setting. And I think a good case can be made at a hospital like Harborview with such a high incidence and a lot of patients pouring in from the community who have MRSA who may transmit that to others to a, a trial of of uh, universal screening. This is not my decision to make, but uh, my recommendation from what I know would be to strongly consider this. If you have local skin lesions, they have to be properly managed from a surgical point of view, and antibiotics are probably not that important. Uh, get your flu vaccines, and then uh, consider combination therapy with protein synthesis uh, inhibitors for serious infections. What uh, do we have as future challenges? We need less expensive screening, and I've recently begun uh, collaborations with Paul Yeager and Barry Lutz in bioengineering here to try to help them with a platform of, of a uh, isothermic amplification method that could do uh, molecular testing for things like MRSA uh, at less than a dollar a test. And this is a very exciting technology. We need simpler and more effective decolonization regimens. We need to have better bactericidal uh, therapeutic agents, and we need to have an effective anti-staphylococcal vaccine. Other than that, I would say we have this problem licked. <laughs> so uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would also, again, like to acknowledge Tony Richardson, who did the basic research work I presented, and Sue and the wonderful uh, staff in the Harborview Micro Lab who are gracious enough to allow me to continue working there. Thank you very much. I'd love to take questions for, if you'll just repeat the question for Phoebe mm -hmm. Lance. Um, so I was at Evanston Hospital where they do the universal screening, and I think they only would discharge patients on nasal mucuricin. So what do they attribute the decreased incidence to? Is it just a in-hospital control, better better infection control? Yes, it's often the. Uh, so the question is, in hospitals who have done universal screening, to what is attributed the benefit of universal screening on on infection rates? And what generally happens as a setting is that if you identify people who have a pathogen, you don't use them as part of a study to see which factor is individually important. You do everything that you can do, and you end up not knowing what it is exactly that worked. But you use uh, 
certain kinds of precautions in terms of isolating the patients. You'll cohort the patients so that only patients who have the same pathogen are housed together. And you may use decolonization, although that's used fairly selectively because it's pretty cumbersome and, and recurrence is so common. The trouble with mupiracin by itself is that um, mupiracin resistance can occur, and there, it's difficult to actually detect. It's hard to get the reagents to do the testing. There's a molecular test, and there is a disdiffusion test if you can get the reagents. Uh, but high-level mupiracin resistance due to the MUP-A gene has been reported. And so widespread use of these agents, it's feared, might just end up uh, losing them as effective agents. And, and it's usually encouraged to use them in conjunction with other agents to try to discourage emergence of resistance. Other questions? Yes, Mark. Beautiful talk, Kerr. Thank you. Do you have any suggestions from your work on this resistance to NO that it might have a different therapeutic approach to treating staph infections? Is there some avenue of attack that can be used along those so lines? So the question is based on basic research like ours and others. Is there a hope that that could be targeted either for immunoprophylaxis or for therapy? And I think that is a hope but it, it's a tempered hope that specific information about how an organism causes disease can be targeted in therapy. Traditionally, that's not the way that we have antibiotics. Our antibiotics are traditionally very broad spectrum. They inhibit conserved functions like uh, protein synthesis or cell wall synthesis. As a result, they tend to be rather broad spectrum, and this may be part of the reason we've gotten into some of the trouble we have with emergence of resistant organisms because we're imposing such a selection pressure. So people have discussed actively trying to make really narrow spectrum agents. If you could inhibit lactate dehydrogenases, for example, in Staph aureus, then the organism shouldn't be able to colonize the nose, and you might be able to get rid of it as a decolonization strategy. And we've also shown it's required for virulence. So the organism then might be naturally killed off by host defenses. But um, it turns out that the pharmacoeconomics of developing a drug make it almost prohibitive to invest all that on a narrow spectrum agent that is going to have a very selected target population. Maybe the exception to that is MRSA because we have two billion people in the world with MSSA and, and two or three percent of them are actually MRSA. So there are companies looking at novel agents, novel strategies at decolonization and therapy. And, and I think it's very important to try to keep an open mind about um, how that's going to work. We also think that because the LDH1 cassette is unique to Staph aureus, that this would be a, a potentially useful target for molecular testing to selectively identify Staph aureus versus coag-negative Staph. Now if you had a multiplex test that looked both for the MECA gene and LDH1, it would really tell you you have a MRSA as opposed to a Staph epidermidis. Yeah.